my name is Simon Dennis, and uh, I am the director of the Center for Transformational Practice, and I'm also proud to serve on the Hartford Select Board. And it is my, um, my privilege and my honor to welcome you all to introduction to community resilience. Uh, and also, I should say it as well, um, welcome you all to Hartford Resilience Week. Uh, this is the uh, kickoff event for a full week of programming that has been put together, uh, workshops uh, and other things, and that will culminate in a celebration at the end of the week. And you can find out about that. There's some flyers right over here on the, uh, on the table, and you can also find out the details regarding that at hartford-vt.org uh, uh, on the town website. Give, give all of the information I hope that uh, many of us can continue to attend not only those programs, but also the uh, celebration at the end of the week on, the, on Saturday. Uh, so um, a word about, uh, the reason I wanted to introduce this event is because I am really excited that this is going on here today. And in particular, the thing that excites me about it is a certain kind of partnership, which we've been <coughs> dreaming about, and now I see happening between the grassroots world of community organizing and the, and the municipal world of community policy and that, and that side of things that are going on together. So here with Crow and with this particular week of events here, we have a really neat partnership of that. And that's a powerful, that's a powerful thing. A lot of towns will not, have not, will not achieve that particular kind of, uh, of synthesis. So I'm really excited about that. And part of the roots of this event also came from both sides. As, um, as some of you may know, the word resilience came into our uh, kind of lexicon, it came into common usage. It was brought in by a fellow named Rob Hopkins. You may not know this. Rob Hopkins was the founder of the Transition Town Movement, and, uh, and he was one of the first person to say to organizers, guys, stop talking about sustainability. Start talking about resilience. When you talk about resilience, you're going to be talking about something that everybody wants to be. Everybody wants to be resilient, and they're going to be able to connect with that vision. So that was the beginning of a switch for a lot of organizers to switch over and to start thinking more and more in terms of resilience. And, uh, and that transition is, continues to go on. Um, the person who formed the uh, Crow organization, which has been the organizers for this, I know that many of our, uh, the Crow committee is here, uh, Dylan is our chair, and uh, Kai, and Laura, hi Laura, John, I know you're here, John. Are, are other Crow members here with us today? Okay, so we have, a, we have a, uh, at least a quorum here of, the, of this committee here. <laughs> The, um, the person who came up with this idea for Crow, Community Resilience Organizations of Vermont, um, is uh, Peg Elmer Hugh. She's going to speak at our concluding event. And um, she was inspired by the work of Rob Hopkins and the work of Transition Town. And because of uh, Hartford's history with Transition Town, uh, that she chose, or her committee chose Hartford to be the one that, that got to start this up and be supported by the overall organization. So uh, coming down from the state, coming up from the bottom, we have, it, we have a, uh, a special convergence here. And I will just add also that Kai and Laura were some of the original forces behind Transition Town. We could say that Kai is the founder of Transition, uh, Transition uh, White River Junction, now Transition Five Villages. Uh, so um, that's, uh, that's a little bit of the history about it. And the idea behind Transition Town is that uh, we have big changes that we need to make in the way that our communities are, are designed and the way that they operate because there's big changes going on uh, in the world in which we're operating. Now the, the, the 21st century is a time of radical change and to a large extent we're kind of just catching up to the significance of the kinds of changes that are taking place. We're going to be hearing about some of that tonight. Uh, and um, the uh, things relating to energy, things relating to food, things relating to severe weather, and that's actually just a part of it. There's a whole kind of economic dimension of changes and economic resiliency, and a lot of it comes down to building tight communities and uh, for people to get to know one another, develop friendships, develop connections in a variety of different means. So that's also part of what's going on here tonight. I hope uh, everyone here can take a moment to introduce themselves to and, and get to know somebody new that they might not know they might not know as well. Uh, another big change that's going on here, and for people who've been uh, very directly involved, I'm transitioning a little bit here myself, uh, with 
uh, municipal politics in Hartford uh, know what an amazing feeling it is to have uh, not only our town manager, but also uh, our town manager's, uh, town manager's wife, Dawn. So Leo Pular and Dawn Pular here participating in this event. This is, uh, this is a climate of, um, of connection and a climate of community which we have been longing for in this town for so long. And here we have it. So I'm just so thank you so much, Don, for all of your involvement and everything that's been going on here. And thank you also, uh, Leo, for stepping forward in this way. Um, I, uh, to so, so many of us, your arrival is, really means a lot. And it's affecting the, the, the feeling of what it means. So I think that's probably a good uh, uh, enough enough on my side. I'll say a couple of words at the end, but just to introduce Leo here, um, Leo is going to uh, moderate the conversation and uh, and carry us through the evening. We really appreciate you being here. Thank you, Art. Really glad to be here. Thank you for the for the kind words and embarrassing me a little bit. But that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'm I'm Leo, and I'm the town manager, your town manager, and I'm very happy to be here tonight. Uh, Resilience is, is a subject that was, has been near and dear to my heart for quite a while. Um, although you, many people may or may not know, I, I have a military background. I'm a retiring Army colonel. Uh, but one of the big things that the Army was working on was, was what they called the Ready and Resilience Campaign. And of course, the Army will give everything an, ac an acronym, so it's R2C. Um, and that we focus on individuals um, because we, feel, we think that the individuals are the foundation of what makes Ready, ready um, installations, and then ready, um, a ready army. So readiness is, is absolutely critical to how we approach resilience. We believed in the army that there were three parts, emotional, mental, and physical. And if you could sustain those, and you were strong in those, or you could identify weaknesses in those, or areas you needed to work on, then that made you strong as an individual. And that's how the Army approaches it. And everybody that I've talked to on my staff, that's, how, that's my approach here in town, is focus on individuals and the people. Uh, I tell everybody that I work for them, and I believe that. I got you know, 100 plus bosses on staff and 10,000 bosses here in town, and I'm okay with that. Uh, because I enjoy that. Um, and as you can see, I've asked the staff to be here tonight. So we've got the department heads, group from the fire department, it's important, and we believe, I believe, that we here in the municipal government have a role in, in resilience inside of this town, and we want to help. Uh, so we're going to learn a lot tonight, and as we go through, we have some great speakers. Um, and then I'll attempt to see if I can't steer the ship, and I look forward to all of your questions so that I can point it to them to answer. Um, <laughs> so we've got uh, Kevin Geiger, who is the senior planner with uh, Two Rivers Ottaquichi Planning Commission. Um, he's going to talk to us about weather and weather events. Um, we've got Martha McDaniel, who is the chairman of the Energy Commission here in town. She's going to talk to us about energy, energy security. Anytime you say security to an Army guy, he gets kind of excited. So, <laughs> and then we've got Will Allen, a uh, renowned uh, individual in the in the field of food and food security, and he's going to uh, share some great stories with us. So. Not stories. He's going to share some facts. And he's going to lead us down that road. So, without any further ado, I'm going to ask Kevin to come up and give us the uh, first presentation. Good. Uh, so somebody will plug in something. Yeah. So something stands up. <laughs> and we won't make you sit here when you're done. You can go. Yeah, this is a little. Side, this so. is a little like being yeah. interrogated. Little, <laughs> I didn't do that though. <laughs> no. And um, so Simon, we had 20. Should we take? 10 and take 10 questions or 10 questions? So uh, let me, you know, uh, what I'd like to do is, is have everybody go through their presentation yep. and then we'll save all the questions for the end and we'll, we'll, grab, we'll look at them all from a broader scale. Okay. okay. So hold your, hold, hold your questions five. to the end, please. Okay. Yeah. So again, while this is uh, coming up, I did, a, I, I kept the fonts and the, most of the PowerPoint stuff, the crazy, the crazy stuff to a minimum. Um, Again, my name is Kevin Geiger. I work for your Regional Planning Commission, which is the Two Rivers Ottaquichi Regional Commission. Uh, our offices are over Woodstock, but we cover from Plymouth to Heartland to Newbury to Granville. So parts of four counties, uh, most of northern Windsor County, and obviously Hartford. Uh, in this case, um, 
I do a bunch of land use stuff and you name it, but I do a bunch of emergency stuff as well. Um, and so I'm coming at this from the kind of that planning perspective where you study and you make policies and you get ready and a little bit from the emergency response where you actually do stuff and deal with problems as they come at you. Um, I'm going to talk about weather specifically, uh, so not I'm not going to talk about earthquakes, I'm not going to talk about man-made events, that type of thing. Um, and I'm going to talk about in a disrupted climate. Disrupted climate is uh, the term that I would rather use versus climate change. Climate change is actually a term created to make you not think about climate change because it has two words, climate and change, which don't evoke any particular response in you except uh, maybe good things. Whereas disrupted climate sounds bad because it is bad. <laughs> and away we go to the future here. Let's see. Um, <coughs> See that works better. I don't know if it will or not. Pointed at this. this. Okay. The first thing is to disrupt this. That's okay. I can just press <laughs> the down button. Maybe I can press the down button. Space button. Space bar. Page down. <laughs> Resilience. Adaptation. <laughs> so the first, the first rule of Mark speaking is you never let John Bowden in the audience. He's <laughs> just gonna cackle in the background there. This worked a minute ago. We actually ran through it. Ah, there you are. At the machine. Sorry, no. that's okay. Um, if it doesn't work. We will just talk about it. That's redundancy. Yeah. Hey, there we go. Um, and so as Leo said, kind of, you can think about resilience in lots of layers, lots of facets, but you're always resilient to something. You're not just resilient in general, I would say. Um, and so there's a standard. You know, how much do you want to go? Do you want to be able to be on your own for a day, a week, a month, a year? And then I think of it physically, financially, emotionally, socially. So physically, you have water. Financially, you've got the cash so that when um, you lose, you know, your business has a problem or you can't get to work or whatever, you actually have some cash and can function. And I mean cash, not a credit card. I think and can function when you need to function. For a couple of days, again, whatever your standard is. Emotionally, um, as he mentioned in the military, it's a big issue, big issue for your emergency crews. You have, they have to be able to function through all sorts of events. And then socially, probably one of the most important things, um, are we socially resilient? Right? If I have a problem, will my neighbors help me? If my neighbors have a problem, will, will I help them? I'm the uh, Pomfret Town moderator, and so I remind people um, that whether or not they like each other, you don't know if you're going to go in the ditch or they're going to go in the ditch. And so you should try to behave that way all the time. So if you do go in the ditch, somebody stops. <laughs> And having been in the ditch, that does happen. Oh, we are, maybe it's just going to do it like one at a time. Yeah, there we go. Uncertainty. Um, I talk about uncertainty a lot around climate because to me, too much of the climate gets into is it 1.5 degrees, 3 degrees, whatever. Um, there are some things that we know, there's a lot of stuff that we don't know. And if you're, um, think and talk like a scientist, there is uncertainty. That doesn't mean you're clueless. And it can come across as, you know, we don't know all sorts of stuff. Well, we, we know a very good amount about what's going to happen. But we've never done this before, never tested the planet this way. We only get one planet, only get one try. Data is limited. When they do models, they run the models backwards and see if they work and they run the models forwards. Um, and so sometimes uh, maybe the model's going to work out. Systems are not understood. We have enormous amounts of things. We don't understand the clouds. We don't understand the ocean. We don't understand the ocean. You name it. So um, there's a good amount of unknown. So if, we, if you see something that says this is what's going to happen, just understand there's a lot of variability around that. Uh, but we don't like uncertainty in our daily life. And so there's a pushback against a lot of climate sciences. Well, we want certainty. We, we need to know, you know, we need to know you're sure before we do any of this stuff. You weren't sure what was going to happen today when you woke up, but you didn't stay in bed. You went ahead and did stuff. So you weren't waiting for certainty before you did action. And a lot of times we act up based upon very little certainty. Uh, 
Um, and we do that every day. So to me, I urge people, get over the uncertainty thing. And I use analogies all the time when I talk. Um, so if, if somebody said, well, don't put your kids in the school bus because the school bus is going to crash, and you would say, well, I have to know for certain that the school bus is going to crash, or else I'm putting my kids on it. You go, no, no, people don't do that. If somebody said, well, there's a 50-50 chance, right? You wouldn't put your kids in the school bus. That's, that's, that's too much of a risk, right? Russian roulette, 16% chance of failure. Doesn't sound like a lot until you remember it's Russian roulette. And then you go, well, that's, uh, failure is not a good thing in that game. So again, it depends upon the context. It depends upon what you know what the risks are. And you would have to be nowhere near certain. You just have to understand the downside. <laughs> not gonna do it. No, it's not gonna do it now. It's gotta be two. Oh, oh no! I gotta keep. I gotta keep you doing this. Ha! Huh. Risk. I'm just gonna use my finger from now on over there. Uh, again, risk is something we're even worse at than uncertainty. We are programmed to think positively about risk. Probably has to do with mastodon hunting. <laughs> I'm guessing because if if you went to the average person and you showed them a mastodon, if I went to John, I said, John, you, big hairy thing, 100 times your mass, and you get this spear, it might squash you before you jab it enough. The risk profile would be like, uh, 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 uh. but obviously our ancestors said, I'm foolish, I'll do it. Right. <laughs> they said, yeah, how bad can it be, right? So we tend to do that. We tend to minimize risk. But we also tend to base risk based upon instincts. So we think sharks are bad because sharks have teeth. Instinctually, we go, oh, things that have teeth are bad. We have an image of it in our mind. Sharks very rarely attack humans, of course. Climate has never attacked us before. So we have no instinctual thing there about climate. Uh, we like short-term gain. We're always willing to take the short-term gain over the long-term gain that has some short-term pain. A lot of things around climate, avoiding bad climate disruption, are going to involve short-term pain to get long-term gain. Based on our past experience, again, unless you were around like millions of years ago, you haven't gone through this, or we're going to go through. And uh, it assumes a static system, and I'll get into that when I talk about flood curves and stuff like that. It assumes that the 100-year flood, what we call a 100-year flood, which is really the 1% chance flood, is going to be the 100-year flood. And that is not the case. Especially if you live on the coast. Anybody here live on the coast? Oh, good, but he's moved. Good idea. <laughs> Hartford is, is high enough. Uh, anybody here from Waterbury? So while I'm pressing the button, I have to tell my water bridge joke, which is if you live in a town with the words water and bury in it, you have flood risk, right? Uh, this is the best information that we have. May not be right, but it's the best information that we have on what we see temperature doing out in the out. Oh, oh yeah. And this little thing has a, has a green one, too, I can point. Oh, it did. <laughs> <laughs> Man, this keeps going here. This one, this one actually has it. So this is northern Vermont, um, not any place in particular. I think this actually may be uh, Chelsea, but uh, they've they've actually New Hampshire has four uh, substate breakouts amongst the climate uh, estimations. Uh, Vermont has two, but forget the graph. Watch the trend is what I say. Uh, here, what we have essentially is a doubling period of about 30 years as far as how many days over 90 we get. So this, first up, 30 year average, number of days hotter than 90. So, ah, that's good, that tells me 10 minutes in. Then we have to learn to stop this, <laughs> which is a challenge for me every time it happens. So that's okay. Um, so again, we're optimists, we go, number of days 90. Not what the chart says, number of days hotter than 90. Doesn't say 91 either. Might be 92, might be 95, might be 100. Um, so you can see we go from where we've been when we were younger 
so a little before now, which is a couple days, three, four, five days uh, above 90 to where we're going, which is more than a week above 90 to where some of us are going, which is a couple weeks of 90 to where we're going over here, which is a good month above 90. Now, that's hot. That's the average year. That's not the hot year, remember. Um, so that's going to be important to think about. And again, the blue here assumes we really get our act together and do nothing that we've done until now. Um, the red assumes more business as usual, also assumes that we don't get any nasty surprises. We know from the science that we've kept getting nasty surprises. We should expect more. But again, forget the trend. So here's the same chart as this, shrunk down. And this is carrying it forward into the future just a little more. So we go up to 99, now we go to 198. So it's basically one more graph that way. But uh, as you'll see, it's a lot higher this way. So anytime people show you things about you know, going out to 2099, ask them, well, what's the next graph? And obviously, if you're a scientist, things are much more important <coughs> out here. Um, but again, something to think about. And something to think about is uh, the Empire State Building was built 86 years ago, right? So when they built that building, they built it for a future. If I'm planning you know, how much food I need for tomorrow, that's a short time frame. But when we're building things, when we're building buildings in Hartford and stuff, we should be thinking about this time frame for sure, because those buildings will be there. We may want to even start thinking about these time frames. Now, um, just to give you a little context, that's 280 days over 90 degrees. Um, that probably is not going to happen. We don't know the upper bound, but we do know that Death Valley has about 190 days uh, above 90 degrees. And that's the hottest place on Earth uh, currently. So we are either headed somewhere towards Death Valley, or hopefully we'll get our act together and, and lock it off there. Obviously, if Hartford's like Death Valley, the things south of Hartford are more Death Valley-ish. Again, I talked about average. On average, your house is not on fire, right? In fact, it's an extreme outlier. If you're in a flood zone, your house is much, much more likely to flood than it is to catch on fire. We have a fire department, though. Great folks, they have trucks, they do things, they put on your house on fire. Again, an extremely unlikely risk. But it's a risk that we understand. It's a risk that is instinctually high, <coughs> fire. It's a risk that we know has happened to some people, so we have experience. And so we rate our, high, our fire risk high, even though our fire risk is actually very, very, very low. Now, they also do rescue, and your, your rescue needs are higher than your fire needs, as I'm sure their call volume because they're going out and rescues all of them. But just because it's an outlier event in planning, we'd go, oh, outlier event. Um, in emergency management, we go, we're all about the outlier events. So that's a downer. <laughs> um, that's OK. It's OK to be down. People tend to be too optimistic. I tend to try to bring them back to Earth a little bit. Um, the current models tend to be optimistic as well. Most of the current models about sea level rise do not take into account the fact that there are two large ice cubes stuck on the Earth and they are melting. There's a lot of water in those ice cubes. Anybody familiar with uh, the ski rack in Burlington? Ski rack is future sea level rise. That's where the water is, all the ice cubes melt. So there really are whales back in Lake Champlain. <laughs> Under that. But emergency managers tend to look at downsides. Scott and his crew, they don't go around sitting back in the apartment and go, boy, you know what, It'll, I think it's going to be a great day. Nothing's going to happen. We should probably go water the flowers. Just hang out. No, they think things are going to happen. And because they think things are going to happen, they are ready for those things to happen. They have trained. They have their gear ready. You have paid them to train and get their gear ready because you think things are going to happen. And so you have prepared. And when one is preparing, one has to prepare for something. And you can be paranoid, or you can be prudent, or you can be like just not paying attention to these. These are the things 
um, that can happen in terms of weather. Solar storms is, is referred to as solar weather, so I threw it in there. Um, super bad if it happens, pretty unlikely. Maybe a 250, 300 year return event. We don't know. Uh, last one was in the 1800s. Um, if it happens, everything on that side of the earth, the electrical things shut down, aren't going for a couple years. Um, we'll have seven hours notice, maybe. So we can get a little bit ready. If that happens, though, get ready. Um, obviously, these are things more likely to happen. Extreme heat in the future, I would put up here. Flash floods we know about. They are increasing. They are coming more and more often. Some of the data suggests that we're looking at maybe a tenfold increase in frequency. So not necessarily that we will have a worse storm, but they will have them more often. Um, Irene, we should expect 20 year event versus a 100 year event or a 1,000 year event. The 1,000 year events become more like 100 year events. Um, the 10,000 year events become more like 500 year events, which matters because those 10,000 year events are, are doozies. Uh, widespread flooding, less than flash flooding, because widespread flooding happens, it's, it ha has to happen over a, a big area. Drought, we are likely to see a lot more drought um, in the far future. Uh, some of the climate projections in the out years in New Hampshire show the entire summer in New Hampshire not raining. So the, we can go 60 days above 90, no rain at the end of the century, things like that. Um, a little bit, wildfire largely comes with drought. Ice storms, because we get less snow, a little more ice, and then obviously big blizzards happening. But you don't prepare for those things, you prepare for the effects of those things. And so I want to talk a little bit about this. Leo mentioned it, um, that it comes down to the individual. If you have two gallons of water and a thermos of hot water, and you can flush your toilet because you fill it in the bathroom, a bathtub a little bit, and you have you know, a flashlight and whatever, then you don't fall down in the dark and get injured and have to call the fire department when they're really doing stuff with the disaster. So the more you all can take care of yourselves, the better off the emergency people will be dealing with actual bigger emergencies. And again, for a couple of days, you don't need to be, you know, all prepper about it. If you are, it's okay. But, um, but the prepared towns, they have their stuff. They've got their gear well oiled so that they can do what they need to do. And that will make the businesses stronger. The businesses, I've talked to businesses before about they can make you guys stronger. King Arthur um, has, a lot, has done a lot of work, but other businesses have done work with generators or whatever so that they don't shut down, which means they can pay their people, which means that people can keep going doing their thing. And so it all goes around. And here's what I say, there's a book over there about family stuff, but um, just do the easy things first. If you don't have a flashlight, get a flashlight. If it doesn't have batteries, get batteries. If you didn't buy a jug of water, go buy a jug of water. It costs like 98 cents, right? Um, concentrate on the two days, not the weeks thing. It's okay to have weeks worth, but a couple of days worth of food, water, batteries, medicine if you have medicine, dog food if you have dogs, um, very basic things, and work with your neighbors and pack a treat if you can. You know, it's an ice storm, the line crew is out there, nobody's had hot water for days, but you have your little camp stove and you have some cocoa and you can make some cocoa and give it to the line crew. Do something basic, basic, and check on your neighbors um, because uh, there are a lot of people who need some type of aid. And again, if you can help them by just bringing them a bucket of water to flush the toilet, then they don't have to get to an unsanitary situation. They don't have to call 911. They don't have to deal with all the other systems that are stressed. You've just solved some problems. And um, stay calm and kind of, you know, mellow. It helps not to be freaky during the disaster because uh, everybody's kind of freaky during the disaster. Right? Um, and then the police can be calmer too because you're not all running around. Oh, we had some people a couple years ago uh, during the ice storm in southern New Hampshire, they were like taking the line crews hostage. <laughs> yeah, because they're like, you gotta fix my power now. I haven't had a shower. Well, you can live a long time without a shower. <laughs> it's not pleasant, but trust me, half the world does. You can too. Um, I think, 
That's it. Questions later. Thanks, Kevin. That was great. Uh, I appreciate uh, the focus on uh, the individual. And I don't think of myself too much of a downer. That's why I, I pay those guys to be the downers. And they, <laughs> they bring me down to earth all the time. But uh, just uh, I'd ask that you hear um, Martha. She talks about uh, energy and energy security and energy interruption. Um, think about what Kevin said. Think about your role as an individual um, and what you can do to help strengthen your small community so that we as a town can can focus on taking care of the other stuff that's out there. Um, so, are we good? Do I have to tap dance a little more? <laughs> yeah? Well, All right. we'll see. We'll see. I think uh, I'm, I'm really glad to be here, and I'm glad, too, that so many members of the Energy Commission and liaisons are here tonight, because um, what I'm about to say really uh, reflects their thinking and our collective thinking over the uh, nine years that the Commission has been in action. And um, I'm going to echo some of the things that Kevin said that um, it depends on what you mean by resilience. Um, and it depends on what you believe you have to have in order to survive what you have to generate for energy. I think most of us would agree that, um, <coughs> that we have, that we, can, we use energy for uh, talking to each other quite a bit, uh, for lighting nowadays, uh, for staying warm in the cold events, uh, staying cool in the warm events that Kevin talked about, and for accessing clean water. Um, Food, we'll hear more, much more about from Will, but the obvious categories are growing it, preparing it, and preserving it. Um, getting around, and um, we depend a lot on energy for long distance travel, um, but also we depend on energy for accessing the fuel we need to fuel the vehicles to do long, -term, long distance travel was an important lesson that the Northeast Kingdom learned during the long um, ice event that happened a couple of Christmases ago up there. If you can have a reserve of fuel, but you need to be able to pump it. And of course, uh, for life safety measures, for people who are dependent on devices to, uh, to live, ventilators and um, other, other devices, and for the police and fire departments to be able to access us. So we need energy to stay alive in, um, in our setting. And this, this is actually my kitchen from the 1970s. And the parts that you can't see include that lighting was a gas light. This was the cook stove. And our communication was by radio. If we needed to know what was going on, um, we hoped that we had batteries, and uh, we hoped that we could pick up a radio station. It's obviously a very different story in a big urban setting or in our modern setting. The things that we think we need to have um, are very different from what I thought I needed to have in the 70s and what many of our ancestors had in other, um, in other times. The issue of resilience uh, as Kevin said, comes in several flavors. Um, these are pictures of Irene, and the first form of resilience is uh, the one that Kevin mentioned, the two days. This is the, um, can I stay alive? Can anyone find me? What the heck is going on? Um, and um, when it gets dark in this flood <coughs> event, can I see where I'm going? Can I find what I need? So those are the short-term issues um, that um, many of us think about when we think about resilience. The medium-term issues, I think the caption for this could be, oh my gosh, um, all the stuff I put in my freezer from the garden for next winter is going to, I'm going to lose it uh, because I still don't have power. Um, I haven't had a shower in several days, and furthermore, I don't have access to clean drinking water. Um, my car is out of gas. Um, 
my cell phone is out of juice and I used to use cell phones to communicate and to summon help. Now I have no access to the people who can help me and to communicate. So this is the medium term, the, the kind of a two week thing that Kevin talked about for Irene. And this is where the energy, um, the Hartford Energy Commission has been spending a lot of our time in the last seven years. Um, and that has to do with making the hard decisions. How do we structure our communities so that we need less, so that, um, so that we are resilient in the face of weather events, so that we have food, so that we have clean water, so that we can see where we're going, we can communicate with each other. Um, and that gets into other areas than just generating energy. Um, it gets into land use planning, and it gets into where are we going to actually put our roads in order to um, keep them from being flooded in the next 100 year flood that won't take 100 years to happen. Uh, what are we going to do with our buildings? Are we going to restore them? Um, are we going to move them? Um, how are we going to build them so that we can stay warm with less energy? This was actually the state office complex in Waterbury. And as you know, that's um, been largely replaced. So I, I, the one big take home message I'd like to leave with you today is that um, this is a very important partnership. That resilience depends really importantly not on energy, so much on energy generation, as it does on energy conservation. Uh, it's the less glamorous thing. It would be terrific if we could, um, if we could build some facilities, generate lots of power, and go back to um, carefree life as we, as we knew it. Um, but we can't generate that much power, and we have to be smart about how much we need to do all, execute all these important life functions like talking with each other, like getting help, like getting clean water, like having food. And so um, I'd like to just draw a little diagram for you. Um, the first thing I'd like you to do is to imagine that this is a piece of pie. So it's a little triangle, it's kind of small. And you think that it's pretty good. This is a piece of pie that you've made and you're fond of it. And then you put it in context. And you put it um, inside the universe of 100 hungry people who want to eat that piece of pie. Um, there's not going to be enough pie to go around. And there's not enough pie by quite a wide margin. If all this yellow area is people who don't get to taste your tasty piece of pie, then there are going to be a lot of angry people. Whereas, if the party is a little bit smaller and there are only that many people, well, the proportion of people that your piece of pie is going to feed is going to be greater uh, percentage-wise than if you, um, if you had a great big party. If you need lots of energy and you can generate that much, you're going to um, be wondering what to do when you don't have a lot of energy that you can't generate. And if you don't need as much energy, then fundamentally we think you're going to be better off. So it's no accident that the word up here is energy conservation and not energy generation, although, of course, energy generation is important. So I'd just like to fill you in a little bit on where the Energy Commission has been um, and uh, what we're instructed to do by the town charter. Uh, this is the town mass, excuse me, the town master plan. This is the energy chapter in chapter 10. And there's some really important um, long-term pieces of thinking here. Um, one is that um, it instructs us to be, or our head, it tells us that our goal is to become a model for sustainable energy practices um, and for fiscal responsibility in that regard. We'd like to create a culture of energy conservation. We'd like 
to reduce what we use by being energy efficient. We'd like to generate, this is, a, this is an ingenious word, talking about indigenous renewable resources. This talks about local power generation that's economically feasible. Uh, we need to think about our patterns of energy use. Uh, again, that has to do with the culture of energy conservation. But our patterns of settlements, where we live, determines um, about a third of our energy uh, uptake. And so if we live far away and we're dependent on driving to get to work, uh, to get to uh, essential services, then uh, overall in Vermont, um, about 40% of our energy use goes to transportation. It's primarily driving uh, long distances. Um, and so, so land use patterns are really important. Transportation is important. And um, the way we do business, um, the way we manufacture, the way we uh, consume, the way we um, invoke the shipment of goods, um, all those things are important to our energy use. And last but very much not least, we'd like for everybody to be healthy and happy. And that's the whole point in, in the bottom in the long run. There are uh, benefits to be achieved in terms of economy. If we are not purchasing fossil fuel, um, we're not sending money from our pockets outside the region, we're supporting ourselves and our colleagues and the people who generate uh, energy locally. There are environmental benefits to uh, trying to help reverse uh, or stop climate change and obviously quality of life benefits that go along with creating the community that it takes to be able to make some of these changes. And so we're absolutely um, on the same wavelength as uh, Kevin is about the importance of community uh, in, in promoting resilience. We're really helped in, in this mission by the state of Vermont. And this is the cover of the uh, the current version of the State Comprehensive Energy Plan, um, which is available for everyone to read. But by legislation, here are the goals for the state of Vermont. We'd like to um, reduce the total energy consumption per capita by 15% by 2025. And last I checked, this was 2016. So it doesn't give us very long to carry that out. Um, We've got, we've got a job to do. It's not, it's not an impossible job. It's not a laughable job. It's a job that we can do with hard work and attention. Um, and it works out to 2050 in the, in the state energy plan. Notice importantly here that we're trying to generate the electricity locally. When you generate electricity locally, you lose less power through the transmission lines. The transmission lines don't need to be built. The economy in the local area stays robust as the um, as, as experts who are local uh, have jobs in creating the local energy generation facilities, um, and we manage it. Um, and so there are many cities uh, across the and, and organizations across the country that are focusing on the development um, and the information science that supports uh, unit uh, local energy generation um, and, uh, and control. So that's an important area we can talk about later if, if that is of interest to you. Um, and then specifically <coughs> helping us get to this goal, the state um, would like us to have 10% of our energy um, reduction happen in transportation, 30% uh, of our energy reduction happen with uh, building efficiency, and for us that's primarily heating, although as Kevin said, it's becoming cooler. Um, and a lot of it is happening um, in renewable power. It needs to happen in power generation overall. So what's the Energy Commission been up to all this time? 
um, first of all, we had to decide what, for whom we were working. You know, here we are, a, a committee of volunteers commissioned and approved by the select board and asked to do a whole host of things. But we, in trying to figure out what our focus is, who our customers are, we've, just, we've talked a lot about who, who the important players are. And we've decided um, and been supported by the town master plan in thinking that it really is all three. It's our job to try to help the town reduce expenditures for energy, um, including the schools, and um, we will be working increasingly with the schools, we hope, over time to reduce energy use, which means lower expenditures, which means lower taxes. Uh, and I think we'd say that's clearly a municipal function. The important conceptual uh, step for me was trying to say, does the town really have any role in helping residents um, reduce their own expenditures and their own discomfort? And we've come down on the side of saying, both in the master plan and among ourselves, um, and I I'm betting within this room, of saying that, yeah, a town commission has an, uh, an important role to play for citizens to help reduce taxes, to help increase uh, comfort, and uh, to help um, increase security. And, and so we also believe, based on some of the um, concepts that Kevin was proposing, uh, we have a role to play with helping our businesses become more energy efficient as well. And how, what areas do we work in? Well, it won't, won't be any surprise. We talk about energy conservation. We've talked about that and worked in that area quite a lot. Uh, lighting is a, a fairly straightforward thing thanks to the development of the um, new technology. It's, it's fairly easy to get maintain good lighting um, using less power. Transportation is a terrible problem. Uh, it's difficult. And we are, as outdoor people who are independent, we don't like to think about moving into town. And uh, the transportation technology really hasn't moved as fast as some of the other technologies. And so transportation remains a bit vexing. But uh, it's an area that we like to think about. Energy generation locally uh, is something that we're, we've done a little bit of, and we can talk about that. Um, it really is our role to help people understand what some of the issues are and to learn how they can personally become able to meet some of the challenges. And as I said before, land use patterns at uh, when we have when we have the brain power and the um, and the time, land use patterns, really are part of what we need to be doing. Now, uh, I, know you can't, I know you can't read this, and the, uh, the, the master plan is very helpful with this, this list of 32 things that we ought to be doing, but I'll just share with you uh, what we actually have done uh, to date. You may remember that in town we had kind of orangey street lights. Um, those were uh, sodium vapor lights that were very energy intensive. And we turned, uh, we worked with the um, Public Works Department and Green Mountain Power and CVPS when they existed and turned, uh, turned some of them off and changed the others over into LED uh, lights. So that the lights are whiter, they're a little bit brighter, and they last, seem to last longer, and they certainly uh, take a lot less power. Overall, that move uh, saved the town on an ongoing basis about $42,000 a year. And even though it was expensive in the year it happened, um, it had paid for itself by the end of three years. And so we thought that was well worth doing. Um, you probably haven't been able to see the rooftop solar installation on top of a public safety building. We took advantage of an energy efficiency and conservation block grant from the federal government in 2012 and uh, organized for that to be put up. You can't see it because it's up on a flat roof that doesn't have a, 
hill vantage point. You can see it from the highway a little bit if you know the look. Um, but that's uh, busy generating uh, about seven kilowatts of power. Um, we did work pretty hard with the West Hartford Library as our initial building to uh, help it conserve energy because it was our most, uh, our town's most energy inefficient building. And uh, then, as you know, I really have. We like to help people learn what they can do for themselves, and these were workshops that uh, help people <coughs> learn about insulating their homes, things that they can do. We have. Uh, periodic meetings about various energy related topics. Each of the town buildings has had a walkthrough that um, with experts from Green Mountain Power and Efficiency Vermont to try to give the building managers a, an idea of what they can do in their buildings um, working in their budgets over time to improve energy efficiency and the department heads have been spectacular in uh, effecting this, that they've uh, taken the recommendations and worked with them. And so um, there's really very little low-hanging fruit uh, to be plucked in saving energy in the town buildings. And they really deserve um, praise for, for doing that. Uh, you may have noticed that at the on the site of the the closed landfill now, there's a solar generation or solar array. That is a creative arrangement with uh, another investor to lease the, the land on top of the landfill um, and to garner some of the energy credits, but, um, but not all of them because the, um, the net metering credits go to the owner of the largely to the owner of the solar field. But we do get some credited against the town building. It was using land that couldn't otherwise be used uh, for anything else, not for agriculture, um, and um, not really for anything else as the landfill um, does its internal work um, undercover. And so that's been a clever thing that uh, Hunter Reesburg organized with Rose Solar. And last but not least, we thought that this list of recommendations, you know, this 32 point, uh, 32 point charge to the Energy Commission was a lot for a volunteer commission of five to seven people uh, to handle, especially since none of us, um, speaking for myself, we're really energy experts, and we've been um, making the case for some years now in various settings that the town would really benefit a lot from hiring an energy expert and an energy coordinator to reduce some of these costs and help, um, help us non-experts through some of the technical steps uh, that are involved in saving energy. We, uh, we're also busy puppies right now, um, and we're engaged in a lot of projects that are exciting that you may be hearing about. One is um, soon to come. One is to work with Crow, to work with the Planning and Development uh, Department, and um, to recreate our, our part of the town website so that you can find the information that would be useful to you about where you can get low energy using lights, what rebates are available to you, uh, how you can build an energy efficient house, uh, and, and so on. Information that anyone who wants to take hold of some of these problems could use, we hope. Um, we are thrilled uh, now to have a short term contract with the Vermont um, Energy Investment Corporation, that's the uh, parent company for Efficiency Vermont. There are short-term consultants to help us do some uh, what we think are important things. One is that we had an energy audit um, of some very complicated buildings. One of them was this one, and uh, which we knew was relatively inefficient. And the other is the public safety building. And that, as you know, is two-part uh, police, fire, very complicated building, complicated set of needs, and it was way beyond our um, pay level, grade 
and e expertise level to be able to help um, the building managers implement some of those energy audits. So they, um, the experts at the EIC are helping us with that right now. Um, we would like to understand better how we're doing in the town spending money on energy and whether any all, all this work that we're doing is really helping the town save money and uh, maybe even help the people save money and um, also help helping um, uh, helping us all be more comfortable. We like uh, we like to do this not just as good ideas but as um, as plans so we know what's coming and so um, the VEIC experts are also helping us <coughs> draft short to midterm recommendations to for the select board so that we have an idea of where we're going and we're not just churning around with good ideas in energy conservation so we hope that um, by the end of this contract, at the end of the year, we'll have uh, some strong recommendations for the select board and for the budget. And uh, using those ideas, we'll be able to creep now toward a longer term energy efficiency plan and energy generation plan. That's another important goal. You may have heard about a short term pilot that's happening now in downtown White River Junction. Uh, it's too complicated for me to talk about right now, but it basically involves having experts here in town uh, twice a month that individuals can consult and businesses can consult, schools can consult, um, about their energy conservation projects. And it's important you should keep your eye out in the, uh, on the town website. We'd love to have um, White River Junction continue to be a leader in, um, in the area, and it would be great if we could support people who have electric vehicles by installing a charging station. Green Mountain Power is willing to help us with that. Um, also important right now is the fact that the regional energy commissions, uh, including Two Rivers Ottaquichi, uh, have been charged um, by the state in certain areas for develop with developing regional long-term energy plans. And this involves the things we've been talking about, energy generation, energy conservation, and land use planning. And so we're working um, with the regional commission in developing recommendations there. <coughs> and last but hardly least, um, Vital Communities, Sarah Simons and Bob Walker have been working hard over the summer with local contractors who are Energy Star certified, BPI, uh, Building Performance Institute certified, and certified and registered with Efficiency Vermont, so that anyone who's interested in reducing home energy costs, increasing home energy efficiency, can get soup to nuts help um, and access to all of the incentives that are available to them. And it, uh, making houses more efficient overall in big ways that you really notice and make you more comfortable is a complicated business because every every house is different and it's hard for those of us who don't live in that world to know what to do and it would be terrific if a person or a set of people could come to your home look around say you need to do these three things this is the most urgent. This can come second. This can come third. This is how you can get the money to do it. And by the way, it's all going to be cash flow positive. You, you, it sounds expensive in terms of what you have to pay out, but you'll be paying less per month um, as after everything is all set up and becoming more comfortable if you're able to do these, make these improvements in your home. Um, so I put in red here the uh, initial community meeting about this program. We're going to call it Weather Eyes Upper Valley after the Solar Eyes, uh, Solar Eyes projects um, that you saw sprouting in various towns uh, around the Upper Valley. And you can come to the Monshire Museum on September 8th at 6.30 and learn something about it. But we'll be uh, really talking about that quite a bit in the next bit, in the next uh, several months. 
and rolling out some of the projects in January. So the whole point is to have a, uh, a happy, healthy, economically sound, functioning community, and that's what we think the energy piece is about. Thank you, Martha. That was very good. I appreciate the connection between uh, energy conservation and resilience. Uh, that, that was uh, a nice connection there. Brought it back to the individual. Um, I'd like to make a plug for the Energy Commission, too. Uh, I've been fortunate to sit on a lot of the committees and commissions that come here. All work hard and all run by volunteers. And the Energy Commission does have two openings, if anybody's, I'll take volunteers for right now. <laughs> <laughs> so next I'll ask uh, Will to come up. I short changed Will on his introduction a little bit, but he's a well-known author of the book, The War on Bugs, and the, one of the founding directors of the Cedar Circle Farm, a renowned organic farm. So Will, I'll ask you to. Uh, so, um, I've been farming organically for 47 years. I grew up on a farm in Southern California and um, my folks couldn't afford chemicals. And so we didn't really have a choice. Um, we kind of just winged it, you know, and tried to figure out, well, what really is gonna work for us? And um, I didn't think that was working very well. And so I decided to get an education and I, um, went to University of California and graduated in 1963. And then I went to the University of Illinois and got a PhD in anthropology and agriculture, studying tropical forest farmers in Peru. And, um, but I was an anti-war activist and a civil rights activist. And so in 1969, the University of California, under the direction of Ronald Reagan, fired all of the activists at the University of California, and so like about 30 of us were fired that year. And one of them was Angela Davis, and another was Blaise Bonpain, and I was one of the lucky ones. And I look back at it and say, wow, if I would have stayed in um, academia, I wouldn't have been able to get all the stuff done that I did in my life. And so I feel lucky that I got fired by Reagan, and I thank him to this day. <laughs> and so, I mean, it was a blessing. You know, I got to have a completely wonderful life. And um, we started Cedar Circle Farm um, in 2000. Um, and we bought it from uh, Bob and Marilyn Stone, who had been longtime farmer, farmers in East Thetford. And they tried to talk us out of being organic. They said, oh, you're going to lose money. You're going to lose the farm. You're going to, nobody's going to come and buy stuff. And they were totally right at first. Nobody came because they had already been buying stuff from Bob and Maryland and they thought if it was gonna be organic, it was gonna be too expensive. So it took us a long time to build the business, but um, we concentrated on a lot of the stuff we're talking about here tonight, and that is, first one is community. We wanted to create a community at the farm, and the way we did that is dinners in the field and tomato tasting and strawberry festivals and pumpkin festivals and, you know, trying to be a destination for people and it worked. Like right now, if you go to the farm in the morning, there'll be 15 or 20 women and men there with their kids, hanging out, sometimes having parties, sometimes having birthday events, sometimes just hanging out, right? Because they feel it's safe there, it's comfortable and it's, you know, they have good food, good coffee, we have a coffee shop, which at first we thought, oh, <coughs> this is a great idea, but then the first year we made $600 the whole year off the coffee shop. Now we'll do $800 on a Sunday. <laughs> you know, and so it, it takes a long time to get people to buy into a different idea, right? And so then um, the other thing we wanted to focus on was kids. And we kind of followed the same model that they did in tobacco. Right? They got the kids to go after the parents to get them to stop smoking, right? And that's what we do with the kids. So we have over a thousand kids come to the farm every year. And we give them tours. They come out of um, daycare. They come out of uh, early er uh, years of grammar school. And this year we had a camp where we had 26 kids 
four weeks in a row, all different kids. And they grew their own garden and they camped at the farm every day and it was, it was totally rewarding. And um, so kids have been a big thing and like at all of our festivals we have an enchanted forest and we'll have Vince come and we'll have clowns and you know we're trying to create a um, feeling where the kids say, I want to go there. You know, and that's what kids do. It's, and their moms can't, you know, they can't shut them up. <laughs> we all know that, right? So, um, so then after about 14 years of um, doing Cedar Circle Farm, we decided we really needed to create um, a parallel nonprofit. And so we wanted to create this nonprofit and we created Regeneration Vermont. And you can, um, you know, see all the stuff that we're doing with Regeneration Vermont on our website is www.regenerationvermont.org. And um, one of the reasons we did that is we realized that um, hardly anybody was talking about um, climate disturbance or climate change or, um, you know, the crises that this climate chaos is invested us with, and nobody's been linking agriculture. Mostly what we've done for the first 25 years we've been talking about climate change is talking about emissions. And our really good friend Bill McKibben has done this fantastic job with his organization, 350.org. But that's all about, um, you know, stopping water from leaving the boat. And in this case, it's stopping the emissions from leaving the planet, right? But the problem is, is that a lot of the emissions are up there for a long time. CO2 lasts 500 years in the, in the atmosphere. Methane, a major greenhouse gas from agriculture, lasts uh, 25 years, but the first 15 years it's front loaded and it's releasing an enormous amount of greenhouse gases and it's 75 times more damaging than CO2. And the third gas that comes from agriculture is nitrous oxide. And 96% of that comes from agriculture in this country. And what happens basically is that it stays up there for almost as long as CO2, 493 years, and it's 300 times more damaging as a greenhouse gas than CO2. Nobody's talking about this. We just went to the Paris meetings, the COP meetings, and agriculture is not on the agenda. The only mention of food was food insecurity. But agriculture isn't on the agenda. And yet in 2009, scientists from the World Bank, which is one of the most conservative organizations in the world, determined that 51% of greenhouse gases came from agriculture. Guess it? We're not talking about it. And so we decided to create Regeneration Vermont to talk about the greenhouse gases that exist in Vermont, one, and that agriculture produces around the rest of the world. And in Vermont, if you look at the greenhouse gas inventory that they did, it didn't even include nitrous oxide or methane, right? And it doesn't talk about the fact that, you know, we have a bad agricultural system in Vermont. I'm sorry to <laughs> inform you of that, but like 64% of the milk in New England comes from Vermont. Yet, Vermont imports 95% of all the rest of its food. 95% is imported from other states. You talk about food insecurity. I mean, if the trucks stop running, they're gonna go to Boston, they aren't coming to Vermont. You know, and so we're talking about like, how do we change this so that we have more food security in our own backyards, basically, right? In our own communities. And if we start thinking about, well, what are the, how would we do that, right? I mean. Not everybody is a vegetable gardener. I mean, flower gardening is the most popular hobby in the country, but not everybody grows vegetables with their flowers, right? And so if we think about what happened in the past during the Second World War, 60% of the food came from people's victory gardens, 60%, you know, because there was no food, unless you grew a garden, because the food was going to the military, right? That was fighting the war. And 
The same thing happened in Russia when the fall of the Soviet Union um, happened. People lived off of their dashes, right? They had these gardens and <coughs> little country estates, maybe only one acre, maybe half an acre, but it was enough that they survived on, right? Cuba, same thing. You know, during the special period, which was really a troubled time, there was hardly any food in Cuba because the Soviet Union stopped shipping it, right? They were in a cargo cult. Almost all their food came from outside. We're in a cargo cult in Vermont. If the truck stopped running, we've got a couple days. We've got a couple days. I mean, we, I mean, almost everybody here eats. I can see that. <laughs> <laughs> Looks healthy, not fat. We're Vermonters, right? But I mean, everybody is eating here. Three meals a day, probably. And like, what happens if that changes, right? So what we wanted to do is, well, let's analyze Vermont agriculture. and. We're really lucky in Vermont because Vermont is one of the only only five states in the whole country that keeps track of pesticide use reports, fertilizer use reports, and genetically modified seed. So we said, whoa. Um, we went through this whole labeling struggle right in Vermont, and the dairy industry kept testifying, oh, dairy is so efficient and dairy is so cool. and." We've reduced pesticide use since we started using GMOs, and we're the state, the dairy industry said, we're the state that has adopted GMOs the most. 96% of all the corn grown in Vermont is genetically modified. Right now. Right now. So every cornfield we pass is genetically modified. And so we wanted to look and see, since we had these records from 1999 until 2012 when we started analyzing this, let's look and see whether the dairy guys are, have looked at the records or whether they're just making this up. And when we looked at the records, we found that pesticide use had soared. I mean, it hadn't just gone up. In the five years from 2008 to 2012, uh, pesticide use went up 39%. 39%, that was an enormous increase, right? At a time when GMOs were dominating, right? We all heard, oh, when GMOs come, we'll not use hardly any pesticides or any fertilizers, right? And nitrogen fertilizer went up 17%, more than 2.4 million pounds extra a year, just to grow genetically modified corn, right? So we decided, well, let's see if we can talk to Ben and Jerry's and Cabot about this and see if maybe, you know, we can get some movement about this. So in 2014, we finished the paper and we went to Ben and Jerry's and they you know, met with them and I showed them a PowerPoint and they were shocked. And they hadn't read the, you know, the state reports on pesticides and fertilizers or genetically modified corn. So they didn't know this stuff. But they just kept putting us off and putting us off. And finally, um, we knew two vice presidents um, of Patagonia and they were on the, um, advisory board of Unilever, which owns Ben and & Jerry's. And they went to the CEO of Ben and & Jerry's and said, you need to talk to these guys because they've got a solution for you, right? And our solution was we had found out from the Chapter 12 bankruptcy court that they were not giving any new loans and they were not giving reorganization loans, which is what Chapter 12 is, to farmers who were using chemicals because the price of milk had dropped from $15 last year to $13.50 this year, and the cost of production is 23 bucks. So farmers are losing money every day. A 800 cow dairy right now is losing about $190,000 a year. So I mean, they're paying more to their farm workers than they're getting paid, right? I mean, that's the situation we're in in Vermont. We're producing too much milk, and we've focused all of our agriculture on milk. You know, while we're, importing all of our food. And so what we've been trying to, um, what we've been trying to tell people at Cedar Circle and in Regeneration Vermont is that we need community farms like Cedar Circle in every community. There should be one in Hartford, and there are a lot of farms around. We're lucky in Vermont, a lot luckier than they are, you know, across the river in New Hampshire. They don't have nearly as many community farms, but we need more of them, and we need to produce more of our food in Vermont because we can do it. Like at Cedar Circle, we produce everything 
you know, from artichokes to watermelons. I mean, literally, you can produce all that stuff in Vermont. We produce dry beans, we produce sunflower for oil. I mean, we can produce all this stuff in Vermont, and we aren't. We're producing corn for cows where farmers are going bankrupt. We lost 100 farm, 100 dairy farms in the last two years. Because these prices are manipulated by the co-ops and, and so what I'm saying to you is like, first of all, we're really encouraging people to do their own gardens. And for those of you who have a little bit of acreage, do your own, you know, meat and milk. I mean, a couple goats, a, a single cow is enough to feed, you know, uh, take care of a, a, a large group of folks. And you can share a lot of this stuff. And the other thing is like community gardens. We need a lot more community gardens. And, and we need a lot more gardens like Willing Hands has. Willing Hands is this great organization in our community that is trying to deal with food insecurity for those people at the bottom, right? And so they um, collect food from behind farms, um, from the co-ops, from the hospital, and a lot of that food is not cosmetic. It's, you know, distressed. It's been on the shelf for a while, and, um, and a lot of the food that um, the food banks give away is dated. You know, it's like two or three days before the date runs out um, that they can sell the product. So Jack Lyons, this really wonderful man, and Terry Lyons, his wife, own a piece of land that we rent from them. And so they suggested, why don't you give a, one acre of the land that you rent from us to Willing Hands and we'll grow a garden of fresh produce. And it's turned out great. The first year we did like 5,000 pounds. The second year we did 7,000. Last year we did 13,000 pounds. And this year it looks like we're already over 15,000 pounds. And that's all fresh food that's going to the food banks. Not distressed food because our feeling and Jack Lyons feeling was poor people deserve quality food just like rich people and well-off people and so our goal is to try to focus people's attention on you can fix this agriculture and a lot of that fixing is right in your backyard and that I mean there's nothing happier to me than going out and picking an incredible tomato or you know, including broccoli in my soup or making basil out of your garden, uh, making pesto out of your garden. It's like, you know, these are really happy times. And we find kids totally love this. I mean, kids really love to know about food because, you know, most city kids, like, it's in a box or in it, it's in a carton and, you know, it's not very interesting, right? So we try to do a bunch of other things that are related to our food production, like we're, we've converted two tractors to electric, and we have solar panels, and we want to put in a solar array along the northern side of our farm. Uh, that'll be a community array, um, and we use cover crops religiously, and that's one thing that we're trying to encourage people to, if you have a farmer as a neighbor, ask him why doesn't he plant a cover, or she plant a cover crop on that field after that corn is on that field, right? Because if you think about it, corn is a four month crop. And a lot of our ground here sits idle, uncovered for eight months of the year, right? If they put a cover crop on there, they're sequestering carbon. Because that's what photosynthesis does. It sucks carbon out of the atmosphere. So all that carbon that's up there for those 300, 500 years, we can take down with agriculture. Agriculture is both the biggest problem in climate, it's also the biggest solution. Because we've got soil where we can sequester carbon through the simple process of photosynthesis, right? And uh, the other thing we're working on is no-till. We just started the last three years trying no-till. And I have to say, this is our best year with it. And we are really hopeful that we can replace plastic with um, really thick cover crops that we can plant into and I have to thank um, Dr. Bronner's Magic Soap because mm -hmm. they bought us uh, a no-till transplanter and they were used but they're great shape 
and a no-till grain drill, and the University of Vermont bought us a roller crimper so we can kill the cover crop and plant into it without using herbicides. So there's a lot of happy hope in you know agriculture, and I just want to encourage you, like if you live next door to a farmer, encourage them to use a cover crop, because like five years ago, only 3,000 acres in Vermont um, uh, of the dairy farms were under cover, and there's 92,000 acres of corn in Vermont, and this year there are 30,000 acres that were in cover crop, and that's a really important change. And if you drive across the country, you'll see that during the winter, the land is bare. If you go to Europe, the land is covered. You know, they have a cover crop on all the time. And so I'm just here to encourage you, one, you know, to realize that you can fix a lot of this yourself. The, what you eat and what you grow, you know, and how you relate to your neighbors who are growers is critical. I mean, it's going to make a, a huge difference because we can actually create a surplus in our backyards. Thanks a lot for that. Thanks, Will. Uh, a lot of great food for thought there. No pun intended. Um, if I could have the speakers come up here, and then we'll start to uh, ask you to get your questions ready. They gave us a lot to think about. Um, we're going to put the lights on and shine right in your eyes. I give, I give. Thank you. There. All right. So we've got the first question. No one. John. John. I've got one for for, for Will. Um, you were talking about how much money was being lo lost uh, by dairy farmers that are producing milk as a commodity, um, but you really didn't. I, I'd be sort of interested in: Are there any farms in Vermont that are producing? <coughs> vegetables or fruit on sort of a scale that they're kind of in that same kind of a commodity market. And I'm just sort of wondering how that compares. Yeah, there are like, um, I'd say there are 15 large uh, vegetable farms that are in the commercial business. We la actually have decided when we started this farm there was a local production for local use. We didn't want to ship to Burlington or Boston, right? We wanted, we wanted to serve the local community because you know, that was our focus. I'd already been a, a farmer for years doing wholesale in California and Oregon, and I, I just decided, look, I really want a face-to-face -face relationship with my clientele. Um, you know, a big problem with a lot of uh, farmers is, um, that are conventional farmers is that the prices are pretty manipulated. The dairy is that way, and vegetables are that way, fruits are that way. So it's like um, most of those farmers are having a difficult time. The real, the farmers that are doing the best, both dairy and um, vegetable, fruit, and melon are, are organic farmers in the country. And there's 200 uh, dairy farmers in Vermont that are organic, right? We have the highest percentage of organic dairies in the country, right? And there's only 870 farms dairy farms left in Vermont. In the 60s, there were 11,000. So the bankruptcy rate, and it's changed all of our communities. You know, we lost all of our country stores almost. You know, we've lost so many farmers, that, and th the farmers, you know, are serviced by all of these industries, right? It's not just farming, it's like all of the suppliers, right? So, mm -hmm. Thank you. Hi. Hi. Uh, Martha, I'd like to address uh, 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 something I was wondering about when you were talking about the uh, uh, Chapter 10 uh, Hartford Master Plan. Mm -hmm. um, I'm new to the area, uh, so uh, uh, we, you were um, the the document seemed to uh, mention a lot about uh, energy use, but it didn't really say anything about what. Um, uh, energy conservation. Uh, like I, I, I would I would think that energy conservation would be the key, the the bank rolling of energy, like uh, storage or something like that. Do, does the uh, the town have any uh, uh, plans for storage? 
you know, like it would be very important in an emergency to be able to um, um, release what was stored back into the system so people could use. Is there any uh, provision? So I'm not, I'm not quite sure I understand your question. Are you talking about the energy that is generated by the town? Um, or I'm wondering about, um, well, it could be by the town or by individuals, or but, but what is the, um, the uh, um, I thought it was about uh, uh, conservation. Mm -hmm. But it, like it seemed like it was more about usage. Yeah, may have been part of uh, part of my fault with the part of the ch of the master plan that I excerpted there. But you're touching on some really important uh, concepts when we're talking about energy conservation. Yes. Um, much of the time, we're talking about just not using as much in the first place. Okay. And so having better insulated buildings. Yeah. yeah having lights that produce enough light without sucking out a lot of power, that kind of thing. So it's not really conserving. It, it's, it's, it's not conserving what well, we're making, it's yeah. needing less. Okay. Yeah. Okay, thanks for Excellent the question. Another, another really exciting thing that we're learning about um, and that is happening at some level around Vermont is the idea of local energy generation and storage in batteries at people's houses um, or at small sites so that uh, in the event of a, a grid disruption, it can be released to the local substation and we experience less loss of, of line power. Mm -hmm. And some clever, interesting ideas have come out about that. Uh, one of the original ideas <clears throat> that Elon Musk had was that if everybody had an electric car and it were plugged into the grid, then the electric car batteries could be used as storage um, and feed back into the grid when the cars weren't being used. So that was a concept. Turns out not to be economically feasible because the batteries fail at too high a rate. Um, but a successor plan to that has to do with wall-mounted, more durable batteries, such as the Tesla Powerwall that Green Mountain Power is offering now um, to some people to try so that you can store power at your house okay. that will power your essential services for four to six hours, um, depending on how much you use. <coughs> and one, one of the things that uh, somebody mentioned, Bill McKibben, uh, and, and uh, what um, he pointed out was that um, in the, the Book Earth, have you seen that? Um, mm -hmm. E A A T R T H. Mm -hmm. But anyways, um, the uh, oh, let's see. Whoa. <laughs> Never mind. I, I, could, I can't <laughs> put my finger on it right now. Thank you. I'd and like so to address it some other time. Sure. So your your comment about uh, electric vehicles is is interesting because as I was leaving the Army's exploring that where. You, you plug them in at the end of the day, they, they zap them down, they're smart chargers, they know how long it takes to charge, they go back into the grid, into the system, and they recharge the car. So, we were doing a couple of experimental sites on so, great stuff. Any other uh, questions? Yes, sir. Uh, yes, um, individual financial responsibility was mentioned early in the program. Um, credit card debt uh, in this country um, or people who have at least one credit card uh, averages over $16,000. Um, college debt is soaring. Uh, many of our people uh, live, are living paycheck to paycheck. A large percentage of our people could not raise $1,000 uh, to meet an emergency. Uh, do you have any initiatives planned for teaching the public um, better financial responsibility? Um, so I think financial responsibility is an interesting, interesting struggle as we go out and try to, you know, where does it start? Does it start with youth? I remember, you know, in high school, learning how to balance a checkbook, and my daughter, she couldn't balance one to save her life right now. So, so where does it start? Um, um, you know, I don't know. Uh, I, I don't think that 
you know, in the town, we, we particularly do. Um, I know that there are several nonprofits that, that are helping folks who, who have had a bad, um, maybe a bad moment in their life get back on their feet, and it starts out with that. There were some great, great news stories of, of what the Haven is doing with some, some young women who are, are getting their lives back together uh, after some, some tough times. So I think, you know, this ten, one thing I've noticed in my time here is there just, there are an incredible amount of services in this area. So if there's a service you need, it's there. So, um, you know, financial readiness was something we struggled uh, with our young soldiers. So I know it's a, it's a struggle here. And I know uh, Kevin mentioned it as, you know, one of those key pillars of resilience as, as he defined it, and, and I agree with that. So um, I'll add that to my to-do list. <laughs> but it's a great point. That was, that was the uh, point I was trying to um, get to, <laughs> was, uh, is, is that the, um, the cost of trying to, um, is, it, is it really important to think about the cost? Because um, the, uh, the, the uh, uh, environment does have to be addressed now. We, we do have to do, uh, the, that, that curve we saw, the geometric curve, it, it, um, it, it, it just shows that it's an it's a, it's a, it's a, uh, accelerated growth. And um, like McKibben was saying that, um, the, uh, the uh, we we can't afford not to take care of the environment at this point in time right now. We can't wait until like uh, 2050, where the 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 the, the, um, um, the amount of um, uh, carbon in the, it just I, it's it's interesting that you happen uh, Will you happen to mention methane and uh, uh, nitrous oxide. But um, carbon was mentioned in this book about uh, how in 2050, the, the same target uh, date, it's, it's going to be t uh, like five, uh, 560 particles per billion, you know, like, uh, to per million, I'm sorry. Where, where it's, that's, it's twice, that's twice what it is right now. Sure. You know, and if you think the, the ice caps in Greenland and, and uh, all the uh, glaciers are, are melting fast now. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like the polar bears can't make it to the next iceberg. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they die of, uh, right. um, what is that, corner. Mm -hmm. You know, because it, it's just, it's it doesn't sustain life anymore. So, yeah, but yeah, we, 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 well, we, we can't, we have like to, a risk question. even if it's expensive, we have to do it. Well, yeah, you, you, you see these risk equations, and there's something um, called net present value in risk equations. And currently, the U.S. uses a, about 5% net present value discount, which is if I had money now and I could put it in the bank and it earned 5%, would that beat trying to save something in the future, which they then kind of backwards discount value. Yeah. And the problem with that is, number one, it assumes you can put money in the bank and get 5%. <laughs> right. So, so you, hail of experts, have immediately debunked that analysis. Um, but there are other weird things. Agriculture sector is about nine percent, if I remember, of the U.S. economy. So, if you do an economic analysis, if we lose the agricultural sector, we still have ninety-one percent of the economy gone. Right? Except the food thing. <laughs> and so there are three times a day. Thing. Right. Yeah, three times a day, which is really, I mean, you know, most of us don't actually. Meet but it's pleasant. <laughs> uh, so, so there's a lot of, to me, roughly shady analysis that says it's too expensive. But even when you see the analysis that says expensive, it's 1%, 2%, 3% of the GDP if we spent right now. The longer we wait, the worse it gets, assuming we're going to hit the target. And to me, we're going to hit the target. Sooner or later, I don't have any doubt we're going to wake up because that curve is not going to be pleasant. However, as a planner, you, you always would prefer the pleasant earlier option than the probably men in uniforms later unpleasant option, um, which says, you know, we got to stop now. Uh, and it's just, it's just easier to do it. The, the thing that you raised has to do with what we call externalities in the economic field, which is we don't pay for all the damage. We didn't pay for whatever portion of Louisiana that just got flooded was due to climate change, right? Uh, we didn't, nobody, nobody's writing a check out there. Uh, we're not paying for the damage that pesticides are causing. We're not paying for the phosphorus in Lake Champlain, even though that's worth a half a billion dollars of damage. 
mm -hmm. to Lake Champlain. But nobody's coming around to Vermont going, you need to pay now, and we mean now, and otherwise you're going to talk to Guido, right? If it was, we would take that seriously, but we don't take that seriously because it's not in the factory yet. And that's where carbon tax or some other mechanism is going to come in and we're going to pay. Well, let me, let me just say one thing about the McKibben thing, and that is that I'm a huge fan of Bill McKibben, and we're friends, and we've spoken on different, you know, panels together. And I said to him, like, 10 years ago, I said, you know, like, you really need to start including agriculture in this analysis, right? And he said, look, I started this movement, and the idea was to reduce emissions, right? That's been my laser focus. And if you want to start a campaign, start one on food, right? <laughs> and so we did, <laughs> right? We started the Regeneration International because we feel like there's 350.org is dealing with emissions. We're dealing with fixing it. We want to deal with fixing it, right? And the way you fix it is sequestering the carbon that's already up there. Because we can't leave it up there. But it's got to come down here. And we're not going to put it in caves. We're not going <laughs> you know, to put nitrous oxide up in the atmosphere. You know, we're not going to use sulfur dioxide pellets. Nobody can afford that, and nobody has shown that it works, right? right. But one thing that does work is soil in forest and farmland are empty of carbon. There's only 30% of our carbon that's in our soils. So it's accessible. It's the best sink in the world, right? And we have to do it. I mean, and it's only about a, a matter of changing your food system. You got to change your food system. You don't have to eat different stuff. You have to probably eat a little bit less meat because like in this country right now, we eat, you know, 12 ounces of meat a day, which is probably not the best thing for you know, keeping away colon cancer, yeah. you know, and so you start thinking, oh, maybe we need to start changing some of these things, and it isn't that hard. A lot of people feel like food is too expensive if you're going to go organic, right? But let me just tell you a quick little story, and then I'll stop. And that is that, you know, if you pay for organic food, you pay for it one time. That's it. And if you pay for conventional food, we're talking about externalities here, you pay for it five times. And let me just run it through you really quick. And that is the first time you pay for it is at the supermarket. I call that the down payment. The second time you pay for it is just past April 15th. And, um, you know, 98% of uh, the subsidies go to corn, cotton, soy, canola, rice, wheat, and sugar. And that is processed food, right? 80% of your diet is processed food right now in the United States, right? The third cost is um, when you go to the doctor, right? Um, 60 million people get foodborne illness every year for the last 20 years, right? And um, 325,000 of them go to the hospital. Already the price of food went way up, right? And 6,000 of them die. That's pretty expensive. And then the fourth cost is chronic disease, you know, diabetes, heart disease, cancer, stroke, obesity are all food and exercise related diseases, right? And then the fifth one, who's going to clean it up? Well, the same people that cleaned up Bhopal, you know, those <laughs> chemical companies walked away from Bhopal after they blinded 200,000 people and killed 8,000 in one night. They just walk away from it, and they're going to walk away from this. You're going to pay for it just like you paid for clean up Wall Street. And so that's what your food really costs. That's what, oh yeah, it's cheaper. You look at, you know, a bunch of beets and you say, oh, this organic is $2.50 and this one's $1.80. Dude, pay the $2.50. <laughs> pay the $2.50. That's what you call paying for the future. So we've got, we've got all these uh, high-minded people who say, you know, we've got to fix the climate. No question, we've got to fix the climate. This is a problem, this is an emergency, okay? We agree about that, but most people don't buy it. 
So, how are we going to incent people to do the right thing and have it be in their self-interest? And you know, I, uh, go, go ahead. I, I bet you have some ideas. Well, you know, one of the things is that um, you got to make it comfortable. You can't make it hard on people to make the wise choices, right? So that's what we try to do at Cedar Circle. If you want to see what we're trying to do there, and if you want to take a gardening class, you know, um, we give gardening classes every year, um, and um, we feel like that's one of the really important ways that you can start thinking about you know, what your food really costs. Because then you're doing some of that labor yourself in your own garden, and you realize, my God, producing this tomato wasn't that easy, right? Mm -hmm. But look what I got, right? And that's what, that's what we try to get people to do, is buy into this different mindset. Look, are you gonna keep buying Ben and Jerry's ice cream when you know that, like, the milk in that ice cream is toxic? You know, we're testing the milk right now. We just collected milk samples and ice cream samples and cheese samples, and we're sending them off to labs to find out because we're worried because the most used chemical in Vermont is atrazine. Over the last, over the last period from 1999 until last year, over a million pounds of atrazine were used. A million pounds, I mean, this is one of the most toxic chemicals in the world, and it was banned in the EU in 2004. I mean, we're so far behind this. And so that's what we try to tell people, let's catch up. And you try to interest people in, you know, doing the right thing. Let's, you know, we want to be, everybody says, oh, let's make America great again, including <laughs> Trump, right? Well, America, you know, one of the ways America could be great is by an example of its food system that was climate focused, right? It was climate focused, not fat focused which is a lot of our food system is, you know, that's where it is now. Coca-Cola, lots of sugar, you know, lots of bad fats, right? So, we're, I mean, if you start eating good, I mean, I'm gonna be 80 in four weeks, you know? And like, I work my butt off all the time and I'm active and, you know, like, do you wanna live a long life? You know, change your diet, change your diet. That's what we tell people, you can, you can live a long life, and you can live a comfortable life, and you can actually have a bowel movement when you're eating. <laughs> 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 if I can jump in a little bit here. But um, but he made you laugh. <laughs> and making somebody laugh. But Bill McKibben is, is catching on. He used to be really dry, you know? And if you turned off the, the sound and watched Bill, you'd be like, that guy is not interesting and he looks like he needs to eat. Right? But now he started throwing jokes. He's not good at it yet, but he's working on it. But, but getting people to laugh is really helps in the conversation. Anytime you're talking with best somebody, it's one of my roles of public speaking. So you got to make them laugh at least mm -hmm. once because laughter cuts across all the things, and we are a very polarized and probably increasingly polarized society. Uh, and so getting people to laugh helps your message uh, because we're if you were the world, we'd be done, right? You know, I don't even <laughs> talk to you guys. Uh, so you got to talk to the audiences that are not here. And there is way too much um, kind of uh, cultural tribalism around a lot of this stuff. You know, I drive a Prius, therefore I do all of these other things over here. And we need to get away from that. We need to start thinking about, okay, who needs those solar things? Why aren't we putting them in mobile home parks? Because right now, putting PV on your roof is perceived as an elite event. Because you've got the money to write the $10,000 check or something and get it done the first time. Well, if it's cost effective, why can't we get public financing or some type of financing in here and put them on, on, in mobile home parks? So we stop that perception that this is all some elite thing because there's way too many memes out there on you know climate change is a, is a hoax so that you know, the Democrats can buy California cheap. 
I mean, just weird stuff. And so to me, we need, we need to break down those barriers because way too many of the solutions get thrown out simply because they're coming from somebody who is not perceived as being of your tribe. And that's, that's an important issue. Please. Oh, uh, I have a question, I guess, for Kevin. How, how long have you been working along these lines? And I'm asking it in a larger context because having gone to other public meetings where we're in, we're from Randolph, and yep. I'm actually here because I'm not hearing anything like this in Randolph. Oh, uh, and, and come talk to Randolph. Yeah, I would love that. <laughs> I'd love to, if there's video taking this, I'd love to know if that's going to be available. Yeah, also, maybe TV. Um, because in in the various planning uh, situations that I've attended, I'm not really active. Um, really everyone's sleepwalking into some great future where we're gonna have bonds and build build more stuff and everything's gonna constantly be growing and getting better and we'll all have all this money and they they really are just not perceiving the status quo. I mean they really are in some other kind of fantasy world. So I'm just wondering how it is that you've been able to operate at all. I have a garden. This is something I've never seen. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Oh, you know, oh no. Official capacity. Right. They're not well, talking this way. No, they're 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 largely not, and so we need to do that more and more. Mm -hmm. um, I do have a garden. It's just sixteen by sixteen feet. Mm -hmm. You know, but I go out there every day and I do various things, and it's it's both a healthful activity. You know, it mm -hmm. kind of helps me. It doesn't give me a lot of stuff, except beans right now, um, <laughs> since bean bean TP phase uh, of life. But um, but I got into this. Um, I'm a, I'm a former wildlands firefighter, so if you see those pictures of the people kind of surrounded by trees on fire, that's what I used to do many, many moons ago. Um, and so that was my entry into the emergency management field of sorts, so I caught that kind of adrenaline-filled, you know, um, slightly disaster <coughs> junkie side of life. You know, things would start on fire, and you say, time to make money, right? We're going we're gonna to work long, long hours. Yeah. Um, so that's part of it. Uh, in Vermont, my emergency management thing is I'm the state uh, main media spokesman for nuclear emergencies. I have been for the last 15 years or so. Um, so uh, Vermont Yankee is now shut off, so it can't go bad in the usual way. Um, but before, when it could go bad, I was the person who theoretically went and stood in front of the TV cameras. Um, and I don't, I don't actually worry about Yankee that much. It's, it's got a lot of safety stuff down there. The casks. Slightly different thing in the pool, which is the current risk. Uh, but so I, that's I've been in the emergency field for a while. I've been in the planning field for a while, and to me, the two are kind of coming together in climate change. I'm, I'm trying to make a new word for whatever this thing is, because the planners we sit around and we use uh, best case scenarios. Generally, we look at things kind of in the middle, in the average. We don't look at the outliers. Mm -hmm. Or as emergency managers, we look at outliers. We look at worst case scenarios. Well, bad scenarios, not worst case. The worst case scenarios are, yeah. you know, really bad. If anybody says worst case scenario, it's not worst case scenario. <laughs> a, a Katrina was nowhere near worst case scenario, even for a hurricane in New Orleans. Um, so I, I get that that way. To me, climate change is one of those things. Uh, climate disruption, which I get to start saying more, is one of those things that. It, it just messes you up. You can do everything you are. You can have the nicest downtown with the nicest businesses and the nicest farms or whatever, and you put them through that heat cycle, mm -hmm. and they are not there. Mm -hmm. um, and that's within you know the next generation. Mm -hmm. And all the science says that the, the inflection point for what target we hit out there is yeah, it's kind of soon because as Will says, all that stuff you put in the atmosphere hangs around for a long time. The climate we're in now, we made when I was a kid. The climate of the future we're making now, we've already baked that in. Whether Colbert said, you know, what's the, what's the hottest month on record? This month. Yeah. That's what you <laughs> exactly. just call it. The last 15 months have been the hottest months on record for that month. Last month was the hottest month on record of any month, period. The last 12 years consecutively, each month has been above average. This is not a blip, folks. Um, and everything points to things getting worse. 
So as a planner, you know, my job is to help you guys build better towns. That may be little teeny ways to do it or big ways to do it, but it's all going to work in this future that's coming at us. And we have baked in a certain amount of additional risk. We need to move away from the, the serious <coughs> risk out there because nothing I can do deal under that scenario, mm -hmm. uh, helps. Um, so to me, I'm happy to talk to people about that. Uh, the biggest thing is talking about uncertainty because people go, well, maybe it won't happen. <laughs> maybe your house won't catch on fire. Let's get rid of these guys, right? <coughs> oh, no, you know what? We actually think maybe our house is going to catch on fire, so let's keep around. Way less likely than that. Okay, you know, we have to make the right decisions. I think that's the important thing. There's a really good book by Jared Diamond called Collapse. Mm -hmm. He's also the guy that wrote Guns, Germs, and Steel. And like the book Collapse uh, explores a whole bunch of different cultures that jumped off the cliff. Mm -hmm. You know, they didn't make the right decisions and they, you know, they collapsed. And, you know, it's up to us to encourage all of our officialdom to make the right decisions, and you don't realize how lucky you are that this town cares about that. I mean, that all, all the people of, that are part of this town that are here tonight, that are involved in this effort, I mean, yeah, Randolph doesn't have that. Every town in Vermont ought to have this. I mean, this ought to be, we ought to be planning what we're going to be doing now, because I have six grandkids. That's what the most important thing in my life is. I want them to have a good life like I had. I got to be in the Marine Corps. I got to be a professor. I got to do all this stuff. I want them to have those opportunities, right? And if we don't make decisions now that are good decisions, especially about our food and our energy, you know. We're not going to have a lot of decisions to be made here. They're going to be all made for you. But, I mean, you've got a good town manager in Randolph, Mel Adams, is your town manager. Um, he's fairly, he's a conservative gentleman. But he's pretty good. I mean, he is a, a planning policy kind of guy. He looks out in the future. Um, how many select board members do we have in the room here? We have a couple, right? And town managers. I go to a lot of select board meetings. Select board meetings, trust me, if you get two people to show up at a select board meeting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Don and one of the <laughs> she doesn't count. She's a town manager's wife. Yeah, she does. <laughs> it's like a plant. But but um but two people at a select board meeting change the agenda. Yeah. Two people will show up and say, we should talk about this, or that thing should be in the town plan, or whatever. Yeah. That at, at the Vermont level, that works. And so and it doesn't all, take you know, it, it angers a lot of people because people get quite defensive. I mean, they really some yeah. defense mechanisms kick in. They don't want it. They want to right. cover the eye. They don't see it. They don't want to know about it. Yeah. Well, um, one of the things I've learned in, in risk management and behavior theory and all that yeah. type of the stuff is there's actually good data that says the more I give you accurate information mm -hmm. about bad things, the less likely you are to do things to avoid that bad stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, Which just doesn't make know. sense. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but that's the way people actually behave um, based upon a bunch of behavioral, serious behavioral studies. So it's not about giving you information mm -hmm. to me, that, which is weird for planners because we're all about like, I got to write white papers and give me information and then you'll do the right thing. <laughs> that isn't what happens. Um, it's much more about motivating people and a lot of that is about finding the right messenger. Mm -hmm. So if you're the person who looks like you're an X camp and you're trying to talk to people in Y camp, find somebody who looks like the person from Y camp and send them. Um, it's why I think, uh, to me, our emergency managers are great spokesmen to deal with things like climate change because they get tired of, de of going out there in swift water rescue, you know, and, and almost catching people. You saw the picture from Irene? If Irene had been during the night, yeah. not during a Sunday afternoon, when all the volunteer firefighters were home, we would still be picking up the bodies. Mm -hmm. And they don't like to do that. And they are great spokesmen. You get a fire chief to go talk about a climate change, you have won the argument. And I would just, I peg on to that. Whenever you can make it in someone's own self-interest mm -hmm. to do what you think should happen, mm -hmm. uh, energy is a great example of that. Mm -hmm. Home building uh, energy conservation. Yeah. 
Oh, sure. So, so when you money. so it oh, yeah. saves money, mm -hmm. it reduces emissions, and you're more comfortable. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I think I've had more resistance to talking to official them than I have to individual folks. Yeah. Is the problem, and they seem to sort of be locked in also by things like laws. I mean, I, well, no offense to any of the fire people, but you know, one of our big issues in Randolph is they want to build this humongous, like two and a half, more than two and a half million dollar fire station. <coughs> which is about three times what the size of it was before. It's a volunteer fire department. I, I don't, I'm not going to speak to whether they, quote unquote, need it or not. But it's got four bathrooms and it's got, ha I, you know, I don't really know why they think they need something so large. Um, but no, I, I just forgot what I was going to say. But they, uh, could, but they could insulate that building well regardless. <laughs> um, they could put solar on the roof. They could do a bunch of things. Yeah, but at 2.6 million dollars. They're not really well, well, projecting where that money is going to come from. Well, that, that gets into like town it, finance it, issues. Right, right. That's a whole different story. I remember where it was, where, where this money was. Well, somebody in me said, well, it's got to be three times as big because now the laws have changed that mandates n number of parking spaces. Well, it didn't happen. Oh. Um, so the mandate that it has to be three times as big as this is Fire trucks have to be larger because that's just the way they make them. So the building, up, so all these things are kind of a domino effect. So you're changing one thing and saying we need this to be bigger, better, more expensive, and then it, it creates this whole trickle down, or trickle up situation where we our, our our hands are tied. We've got to make this building four times as big as it was. So we won't do things like that in Hartford. I got one question over here. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, then we'll, we've got to start to, to wrap it up. So, okay. So I'd, I'd just like to speak especially to Will and, and Kevin and all of you about humor and what, what usually stops most people is this famous problem we have everywhere. No good deed goes unpunished. Yeah. <laughs> do you have any advice? I mean, clearly, I mean, Ronald Reagan, talk about an adversary. You know, how do you solve, how do you, how do you begin to approach the problem of no good deed goes unpunished? You know, you can serve, you save, rates go up. Classic situation, you know. We save on energy and now the rates are gonna go up because the company has to make its money. That seems to me to be the biggest loophole stopping the conservation movement is as soon as you save, somebody wants to exploit that by increasing the rate. How, that's the one thing that really, every time you work a problem through, that's where you get stuck. Because then somebody goes in, and they're still gonna nail you. So how do we, how do we nail that? How do we nip that one in the bud? Because once you do, a lot of opportunities will really become possible. Like right now, GMP, right? It's a wonderful day, it's the most progressive president of a power company you get. But we're still having this issue on um, on how many solar panels you can put up in your house. The fact that you can't sell it back. Why can't people engage in the act of generating the power? It's because no good deed is going to go unpunished. You can only put it in the to replace the energy you're making. Because now we've got to still be able to charge you because you got to pay for the line. Yeah, I mean, so so how do we, that's, that's the big hurdle, that's the big energy hurdle, is how to get past that so that a town can be an energy company co-op, so that a town can become like EC Fiber, poor EC Fiber, tried like Banshees, you know, to get that same system going, got hit every single time. There's so many little companies that try to start, and they're nailed because somebody is like, uh-uh, uh-uh. You're going to, I'm not in my court, you know, and they're just, the big guys are stopping us, so how do we get past that? Uh, I mean, part of it is going to be to cost those externalities somehow. Um, how that's going to happen, I don't know, but that's going to be part of it. Energy independent Vermont. Uh, that, that's part of it. Wait. I think part of it um, is going to be maybe we just need to be more villainous. How about um, monkey wrenching? Well, I, there's <laughs> monkey wrenching, that, that probably will come down the line, I think. Um, the, the other thing is is what I call Argo. Anybody see the movie Argo? Yeah. There's a great scene where they're 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 giving the State Department honchos the, the explanation about oh we're gonna we're gonna create a fake Canadian movie crew and, and they're like what you know is that your good idea and they're like no that's the best bad idea mm -hmm. that we have and and I think it's important in the discussion um, 
because a lot of people want to find a happy ending that's cheaper and easier and whatever. Um, I don't believe that that exists. I believe that there exists better bad options, <coughs> but we are long past the good option stage of this event here. Um, and so I think it's important to be blunt and honest about that. Um, and, and that will fill in the discussion somewhat because people will necessarily want cheaper power. I don't know if we're going to ever have cheaper power. Maybe we should just have a lot more expensive power. Um, certainly if we had a lot more expensive flood insurance, then people wouldn't build in silly flood places, right? Um, that type of thing makes sense. Now, obviously, if you're one of the persons who owns those houses, you're going to be unhappy about that. But there's no way we can square all that happiness and the effect that we want out there. And just, I'm a planner, so I'm not, you know, I'm in the good deed goes unpunished business, right? Uh, I write zoning. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody ever says, geez, thanks for updating the zoning. <laughs> I mean, like, just uh, another answer to your question, and that is that, you know, Bernie was trying to tell people, look, if you want things to change, you're going to have to get off your butt and do something. About it. You cannot sit back and say, you know, we really want this to change, but I hope somebody does it. He, we're the ones that have to change this. We're the ones that have to say, when those rates go up, we protest. And we found, like when we were doing the labeling <coughs> struggle in Vermont, we got the grassroots out. And how do we do it? We had seven town meetings around the state to educate people about what was going on. And then they, you know, they took the bit and ran with it, right? And that's the same thing we need now. We need an active, constituency. We need people that really care and that aren't afraid to get out. You know, I mean, it's not always comfortable to be an organizer or to try to organize people. But what we found when, when we were doing the labeling is of the 30 people in the Senate, it was 28 to 2 in our favor. And seven of those people were either libertarians or republicans, right? And that's the thing is, is like, that's what we find about, out about food politics is Republicans and Libertarians and Democrats and uh, progressives all want clean food. They all want safe food. And so it doesn't matter how they vote. It matters that they want to eat safe stuff and they want to feed their kids safe stuff, right? So that's how we, that's how we go about it, trying to activate people. You know, you're the one that is going to have to do this. We're the ones that are going to have to do this together. And this is such an exciting thing because there's a collection of people here that really get the shit. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, sorry. It's actually the critical ingredient. <laughs> so, so real quick, let's give them a great round of Final remarks. There was uh, one thing that was said that really jumped out at me when it was said. I just want to mention it again, uh, Kevin. You said, as a planner, my job is to help us build a better town. Yeah. <laughs> and I think part of the reason why that's like really struck me when you said it is I thought, oh, you know, uh, that's Leo's job too. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and come to think of it, that's also uh, Scott's job, right? That's that's Phil Caston's job. That's uh, that's Tad Nunez's job. Help us build a better town. And uh, also, that's, uh, that's, you know, as an activist, that's Kai's job, that's uh, Laura's job, that's Debbie Diegley's job. They're also, you know, social organizers. They're in the business of helping us build a better town. And uh, so it's sort of like, oh, you just gotta think, like, wow, we really have everything sort of coalescing here in a sense of solidarity. Solidarity around putting on the table, what are we confronting? And beginning of solidarity around what can be some of the solutions that we can bring forward together. So I really want to, I really want to appreciate the department heads that we have here in the room, you know, of the people that are uh, working in this arena all day and now staying eight o'clock after eight o'clock. I assume that uh, uh, not every meeting that uh, Leo is going to run is going to run over time here. <laughs> 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 
<laughs> this winded a little bit. <laughs> but it did for a good reason, because it took us a little while to get up to momentum or whatever, and I could really feel a, a powerful sense of coming together across very different cultural lines that we have here, right? We have some tree huggers. We have the, uh, we, you know, the organizers are the, the stereotypical things for organizers, like the smelly hippie, right? That's the, uh, and, then, and that's not necessarily the same culture as, as we have in, in town hall, right? But here we have beginnings of some kind of solidarity, or the beginnings of coming together, and I feel like that is so powerful. So I really want to appreciate you all for being here. And in particular, appreciate our guests, your expertise, and uh, your wit, and uh, experience, and long history uh, working in these things here is really powerful for us. I appreciate you being here so much. Um, and also, on the basis of that, somehow we kind of developed a sense of uh, connection with one another. Thank you, Leo. Let's